Good afternoon, everyone. Hopefully you can hear me. Uh, my name is Professor Juanita Todd. I'm the Deputy Head of College for Engineering, Science and Environment here at the University of Newcastle. Uh, and we're on the beautiful lands of the Awabakal people and the Darkenjung people, uh, who were the traditional custodians of our beautiful campuses. And I pay my respects to their elders, past, present, emerging, and anybody who might be joining us today. It is my pleasure today to introduce our lecturer and on his national tour, uh, Professor Konstantin Avrichenkov, and I believe he enjoins us under the auspices of a number of societies for industrial and applied mathematics, in particular being our 2023 AMSI AMZM lecturer. So it's a pleasure to have you here. Um, and Professor Avrichenkov joins us from the National Institute for Research in Digital Science and Technology, or INRIA, and Konstantin Avrachenkov received his master's degree in control theory from St. Peter St. Petersburg State Polytechnic University in 1996, uh, his PhD degree in mathematics from the University of Th South Australia in 2000, and his habil habilitation from the University of Nice Sophia Antipolis in 2010. Currently he is director of research at INRIA uh, in Sofia Antipolis, France, he is an Associate Director of the uh, International Journal for Performance Evaluation Probability in the Engineering and Information Sciences, the ACM TOMPEX, Stochist uh, Stochastic Models and IEEE Network Magazine as well. Konstantin uh, has co-authored two books, The Analytic Perturbation Theory and Its Applications for CM in 2013 and Statistical Analysis of Networks by NOW Publishers in 2022. He has won five Best Paper Awards and his main theoretical research interests are in Markov chains, Markov decision processes, random graphs and singular perturbations. He applies these methodological tools to the modelling and control of networks and to design data mining and machine learning algorithms. And today, I believe that we're going to hear from you on reinforcement learning for restless bandits. So it's my pleasure to get out of your way and uh, hand over to you for your lecture. Thank you for joining us. Thank you very much for your very kind introduction. Also, thank you for hosting me uh, on this beautiful campus, beautiful university. I already got to see a little bit. And it's wonderful. It's university in, inside the native forest, very nice. Uh, I also would like to thank AMSI and ANZIA for giving me this opportunity to, to, to go with lectures around Australia. And uh, it's really special for me because uh, I've done my PhD in Australia, in the University of, in the university of South Australia. And, yes, it, it feels great to, to be in Australia with this honorary tool. Thanks a lot. Okay, uh, let's start with uh, the lecture. Okay, so this, uh, this work which I present now combines two paradigms for restless bandits, Whittle Index and Q Learning, and then it goes a little bit deeper. Uh, don't worry if you don't understand the keywords like restless bandits or Whittle index or Q learning, uh, ho hopefully you know at least a little bit about those concepts after the, after the lecture. Okay, so what are restless multi-arm bandits? Uh, these are uh, coupled Markov decision processes or Markov control processes. Uh, suppose we have n uh, control Markov chains uh, whose state we denote by x i n. So x i n is the state of the Markov chain or arm i at the discrete time moment n. And this value, uh, this process takes value on a finite discrete space S. Uh, the dynamics is stochastic and is defined by uh, the control transition kernel, by this kernel, pi i of these arguments. 
So of always in this presentation, the upper index will correspond to the number of arm. And uh, the arguments have the following meaning. So if we are currently at state k and use control u, then we transition to the next state j with this probability, with the probability given by this function. And what is specific about uh, bandits problem? That the bandits of arms could be in only two states, either in a passive state or in active state. Once control is chosen, uh, we get a reward. So th the reward is a function of the control and the state. And uh, for passive modes and active modes, the controls, uh, the rewards can, can be different. We make the following assumption for, for theoretical purposes. Uh, this assumption is called unichain property. So we assume that there exists a distinguished state, say I0, belonging to the state space, such that this state is reachable with strictly positive probability from any other state under any stationary policy. So in essence, this assumption says that the Markov chain is uh, well, well connected. So what, what is our objective? Our objective will be the maximization of the long run average reward. So it's the limit of the expected average. Uh, again, let me remind you that N, M and N stands for the time index. So we sum all the rewards for all the arms and then we sum the rewards for all the time slots, and we divide by the number of time slots up to the current time moment. And then we consider the long time horizon when the, uh, this number of time slots moved, moves to infinity. Okay, so this is our objective. However, as I mentioned in the beginning, the Markov processes are coupled. And they are coupled by means of the following constraint. And the constraint says that uh, at each time instant, we cannot activate more than m arms. So this is what, what is written here. So all the above uh, is, is called restless multi-arm bandit, bandit problem. Uh, the restless multi-arm budget problem is probably hard. In the 1999, Popodimitro and Tsitsiklis established that uh, the P space complete. So this is the class of complexity which contains problems which are even harder than NP hard. So, so <laughs> this means that these problems are really hard. Uh, how, how do we deal with them? So one of the breakthrough in this area was uh, achieved by Whittle's ingenious observation that we can at first try to replace hot constraint, so this hot constraint on the number of uh, activated arms by a time average constraint. So instead of uh, asking that every time slot we can activate at most m arms, we require that we can acti activate m arms on average. So, so this is a relaxation uh, of the original set of co constraints. And uh, why, why this is uh, very helpful? It is helpful because uh, we can decompose the problem thanks to the technique of Lagrange multiplier. So what we do, we multiply this constraint by Lagrange multiplier, 
and take it into the objective function. Okay, so now instead of uh, maximization of the original goal, we have an addition uh, with the Lagrange multiplier lambda. And, 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 this, and this is decompo now naturally decomposed with respect to the arms. So we can do optimization for each separate arm. Right? So of course, that's a great simplification. But we also pay a significant price for this. So instead of per step hard constraint, we now have an average constraint. And in some problems, maybe it's not feasible, right? So uh, like um, the number of constraints for each step uh, could be, in some resource allocation problems, the number of available GPUs, right? So, so it just you have this maximum amount of GPU. Okay. So under the unichain assumption, C0, um, so we have for this control problem, now we can write the Bellman equation, Bellman dynamic programming equation. Uh, and this Bellman dynamic programming equation uh, has two variables, one for each arm one scalar uh, variable and another uh, vector variable. So the scalar variable under the, uh, the C0 assumption is unique and actually equal to the optimal reward. And V is the function V, uh, so-called value function, is unique up to an additive constant. So one very uh, useful interpretation of Lagrange multiplier lambda as a subsidy for passivity. Right? We can see it actually from this formula that uh, the larger value of lambda, the less likely we activate this arm, the given arm. So the Whittle proposed the following uh, heuristic. Um, so first, uh, he said his, he defined um, multi-arm bandit problem to be indexable. So multi-arm bandit problem is said to be indexable if the set of passive state increase monotonically, monotonically from the empty set to all of S as the subsidy is increased from minus infinity to infinity. And in this case, the Whittle index is defined to be a, a lambda value for which both active and passive modes are equally preferable in state k. So for each state, state k, we have its own Whittle index. So, you know, if, uh, if I can interpret this in a frivolous uh, way, um, that would be, suppose, as I think most of us like our job very much, right? So even so, some uh, of our friends say, well, you have fun all, all, all the day, right? And you get paid for this. What, what, a, fun, what a wonderful job. So uh, the little index interpretation in our case would be how much pay we, we would accept not to work. Right? So that's that's an interpret also one interpretation of the Whittle index. Okay. Uh, so restless multi-arm bandit problem has numerous applications. And most applications come from the areas of resource allocation. So where you have finite resource, and uh, you, ha you have distributed, you have to distribute it. So just to name a few, there are many more. Uh, there is application in sensor scheduling, um, and in general in wireless channels. So you have a certain number of frequencies, and you have to distribute these frequencies uh, among users. Then there, there is uh, multi-agent coordination, congestion control in the internet networks, 
cognitive radio, and web crawling. I'll tell actually a bit more details about web crawling. Um, and then the A-B testing. Um, so, so how many of you know what, what is A-B testing? If not, I'll tell a few what's. It's quite an interesting application. No? No. So um, often in the electronic commerce, they need to understand um, what version of the website is better for customers. So which version of the website attracts more customers and generates more, more purchases. So what they do, they uh, make, say, two copies, but it could be more than two copies, but typically they have two designs, and they want to test these two designs. So then they have a choice, right? So for each customer coming to their website, they have a choice, design A or design B. So th that's exactly right. So you have only one slot, so you have M is equal to one. You have to choose one, but you have two options. So that's uh, one nice application. And another very important application is application in clinical tri trial, where you, you have to try, say, two, uh, again, two alternative treatments. And this is in spirit actually similar to A-B a -B testing. OK, so uh, I'll tell you a little, along my presentation, I will be uh, referring several times to this application because I worked on this. Um, so one application is in web crawling. What is web crawling? You have, say, a search engine, but not necessarily, typically a search engine. And this search engine needs to collect and to update the information from the web. So uh, the crawler connects to a website and then crawls, downloads the most up-to-date information, the most up-to-date versions of the files from, from that website. Right? And then goes, and that goes to the next website. Typically, the crawl of one website is done in exhaustive manner. So now the, the number of arms is the number of websites and uh, we need to choose which arms to activate, right? Which arms, obviously, just because of the, our limited bandwidth, even Google has a, not an infinite internet bandwidth, so because of this limitation, uh, they cannot crawl all the internet at once, right? So they need to prioritize, need to choose which website to crawl in a given moment. So you say, OK, the Whittle index policy, uh, by the way, I think I didn't mention what actually the Whittle index policy. So you compute these indices uh, for each state, lambda of k, and uh, at a given time moment, for each arm, each, each arm is in its own state. So for each, for that state, you can compute the Whittle index and you sort arms according to the Whittle indices. And you choose arms with the top Whittle indices. Right? And, and the top of size M. So this way, you satisfy actually constraint exactly each time. So you satisfy not on average, but exactly and there is no, no problem with the violation of the constraint. Uh, of course, it's, it's heuristic. It's known to be heuristic. But the nice mathematical results, which show that in the case of uh, the regime of large number of arms, this heuristic is actually becomes asymptotically optimal. So that's a very nice result. Take, for example, the web crawling application there are many web servers, right? So this result essentially says that in this setting, our uh, Whittle index heuristic will perform nearly as optimal policy. 
Yes, that would be probably many con researchers from, say, control theory domain, uh, control of stochastic processes would immediately, I think, answer this question. So what, what is the problem, actually, with Whittle index? Uh, the problem is that we have to know the model. So uh, right to come, yes, to, to elaborate, for example, for A-B testing, we need to know the behavior of the customer, right? That's too much to ask or we need to know all the parameters of the service that we want to crawl. So we, we, we need to know completely the dynamics of the arms. And that's a big, uh, big drawback. Uh, okay, so ca can we do, this is what I say, full, full model, the knowledge of the full model. So can we do something about this? Yes, for, fortunately it's possible to, to do something, and uh, th that approach to, to overcome the knowledge of the model is called Q-learning or reinforcement learning in the context of Markov decision processes. And it was uh, um, invented by Watkins in 1988, and it still, I think, make the basis for most reinforcement learning techniques. So originally, Q-learning was developed by Watkins in the context of discounted reward, where instead of uh, long-run average reward, we have a geometrical dis discounting. Uh, however, since then, there have been developed several versions of the original Q-learning, and one version was designed for long-run average reward. So it was proposed in that paper. So uh, Q-learning is based on the idea of stochastic approximation. Um, and, uh, and it uses a so-called Q-table. So Q-table um, is a table defined on the set of uh, states and, and controls. So in our case, since we have two controls, zero and one, it's just table, say, of two columns and the number of rows corresponding to the number of states. And in fact, in essence, it is a uh, Robbins-Monroe stochastic approximation scheme for, for the optimal control. So, well, um, I, I think, uh, it, it, it takes time to, to, to explain the intuition behind the Q-learning. So j just, uh, just <laughs> believe me that uh, it works and in, in fact it, uh, there is a proof that it works. Okay, the original Q-learning is for basic Markov decision process. But what we have we have a Markov, we have a set of coupled Markov decision processes. And what, in fact, what we need to learn, we need to learn the Whittle index. So if, if, we, if we go back to the equation defining the Whittle index, this equation, in fact, this equation comes from the um, Bellman the dynamic programming equation. So if we um, reinterpret this equation, we can reinterpret it in terms of Q values. And in terms of Q values, it will be simply like this. So in fact, what, what we can do, we can ap apply stochastic approximation method to solve dynamically this equation. That's nice. And actually the stochastic approximation scheme for this equation is not difficult at all. So it's in the spirit of feedback control. So if we have a positive 
difference between uh, the Q value for the active control and Q value for the passive control, we increase the value of the lambda. And if uh, the Q value for the active control is smaller than the Q value for the passive control, we decrease the, the, the value of the lambda. So really, it's uh, in the spirit of the feedback control. Uh, there are generally two ways to do reinforcement learning. So reinforcement learning could be done either in a so-called off-policy mode or in the on-policy mode. So off-policy mode is a little bit like, um, you know, uh, to compare it, we kind of, we, yeah, so maybe off-policy corresponds in our terms with lecturing. So first you lecture student, and then you try to do some practical tasks, whereas on policy corresponds to kind of internship mode to teach students. So you train students by letting them to do actual task. And so you just need to make sure that you, gi you give to students a task that they will not break, right, or they don't harm themselves. So, so that, that, that's the same about on policy. So if you can afford to, to, to experiment with your system uh, and your system is not so critical, then you can do on policy. Uh, so what, what is on policy? Uh, with probability one, every time step, with probability one minus epsilon, we sort arms in the decreasing order of the estimated little index, lambda n, and render the top m arms active, and the remaining arms are passive. However, with probability epsilon, we render active m random arms, chosen uniformly and independently. And again, the remaining arms are passive. So like this, we uh, give some chance to complete exploration of the system. Again, under unichain property, uh, some really not restrictive condition on the time step. And uh, again, non-restrictive and very, very natural condition that the problem should be little indexable, we can prove that our estimate of the little indices converge to the true values. And the converges, converges is almost surely. So let me just, in very high level, outline the proof. The proof has two parts and uh, there are several steps in each part. But, well. um, and the first part um, is about synchronous updates. So we assume that in parallel, we can work on every state. So for every state, in parallel, we choose a control according to Q value and do a next experiment. So then we can rewrite the sequence for the Q value, the stochastic approximation sequence, in the form of a martingale difference. And yes, well, the martingale difference is actually defined th this way. And then if, this is, this is a big if, so if our iterates, uh, I'll come back to, to remind you. For example, this iterate. So if lambda n remain bounded, and the same for qn, so if qn and lambda n are bounded, then on the fast time scale, the iterate for q values 
can be approximated with the set of with one set of differential equations, and then on the slow time scale, we approximate the value of the Whittle index with the other uh, set of differential equations. So now the question is, um, and then we do the stability analysis for these differential equations. So now the, the main question is, can we somehow guarantee the boundness of the iterates 9 and 10? And uh, luckily enough, just before we started our research, there was a related research on the stability of two time scale stochastic approximation schemes just in 2017. And there, the authors had four technical conditions, actually very technical. Uh, so if we were able to check these four technical conditions, uh, we could show that the iterates are bounded. So actually, most of the time to prove this result, it took us the verification of these technical conditions. So it was not straightforward to, to check them. And the proof for the asynchronous updates requires some additional rescaling, about which I will not speak. So le let us consider a few small size numerical examples. And uh, maybe in the matter, uh, in the interest of time, I'll go to the next example directly because it's related to my favorite application, web, cr crawling, web crawling. So the example is like this. Um, in the passive mode, we, with high probability, the system moves to the next stage. So if to be specific in the context of web crawling, it means that if we don't crawl, the documents get older, right? So we can say that the next stage is, say, one day older, right? So if you don't crawl, your document becomes with each day older and older. However, if you crawl the document, it, the set is reset to zero, right? So it becomes fresh. So set zero is fresh. A state, a state zero is fresh. So we, we, res, we are resetting to, to the initial uh, state. And, to, and to we, we, we take some reasonable reward. Okay. Again, so th this actually example uh, models very well uh, the dynamics of the web crawler. So we take in this example, it's it, it just a numerical exercise, uh, n arms, and we say that we can activate no more than 20 arms, and we take absolute this exploration parameter to be equal 0 0.1. So it's like 10% of our efforts are, uh, are given to exploration. And, and we see that, uh, so, so here the, the dashed lines are theoretical values for the Whittle index, and uh, the solid curves correspond to, uh, to our scheme. So in, in fact, you know, it converges, uh, I should notice that it converges very fast for a stochastic approximation scheme. A typical stochastic approximation scheme has much slower convergence. And the reason for this is that here we use the statistical multiplexing. Because here we can see that all the arms are identical. Then it means that uh, by doing learning process on 100 arms, we in essence accelerate the stochastic approximation process by, by 100 times. So again, you see that here like in the theoretical example, it was beneficial to have many arms. In practical terms, it's beneficial as well. The more arms you have, the quicker you collect uh, the information. And, 
And for practical terms, you can even take constant step size. It, it also works quite well. Um, of course, for constant step size, the convergence is not guaranteed. So there is the conditions of the theorem uh, are not satisfied. And we see that here, for example, for this index, we don't have convergence. But in fact, what we need to do, we need to get a good ordering of the indices rather than exact values. And here we still get correct ordering. So, so in practice, it, it will work as, as good as, uh, decreasing, as the decreasing step size. OK, so somehow all looks good, right? So now we don't need the full no knowledge of the model. We can use Q-learning to learn Whittle index. Are there any further issues? Any, any guess from the audience? A small hint, it's, uh, it's related to the size of the state space. So very often in practical, um, in practical systems, the state space could be very large. And we need to deal with, and then it means that we need to deal with very large Q tables. So what, what could be a solution to overcome this difficulty? Uh, we could use some approximators, approximators for Q table. But, but not only, we can also approximate the Whittle index itself. So what we do for each state k hat, we approximate the Whittle index, but some parameterized family, where this family depends on, say, para vector of parameters sigma. And the same for Q values. We parameterize Q values by, say, some family whose uh, parameters uh, is given by a vector uh, theta. And in particular, uh, these families could be just deep neural networks. So this is just one example, but just an example. If you remember, we needed to find the Whittle index. We needed to solve this equation. But now we, right, we even don't have Q values because we replace it by approximation. So in this case, we need to replace this equation by the minimization of the following expected error. So in fact, it's the expected uh, residual of this equation. We can do it by stochastic, uh, mini batch stochastic gradient descent. And this is ju just that. Um. And similarly for the Q values, right? We also approximate Q values with some function depending on the parameter theta. And we need to find, given current theta, we need to find next theta. And this we can, die, we can do by minimization of the Bellman error. And, and this, this is done uh, in the form of the following theta update. So uh, it's also kind, it's not really a gradient uh, descent uh, method anymore. Um, and uh, l l let me uh, just show maybe a few numerical examples. Uh, I already mentioned circular di di dynamics and restart problem. In particular, I discusses more detailed restart problem. So here it is. And uh, we compare two flavors of this deep uh, Q learning, uh, the so-called DQN uh, version and full gradient DQN. And what is the difference between these two uh, versions of the deep Q-learning? The difference is 
in fact, in, um, in this term. So in the DQN, this term is absent. And the proof goes through only for the version with this term. However, miraculously, in practice, the, the, the scheme without uh, this term also performs well and sometimes performs even better than the version for which we have a proof. Okay, so that, that, that happens quite often in practice, right? So there is something still to understand if we can theoretically characterize the convergence for a bit simpler scheme or well, it's just uh, like it happens in practice and we cannot do anything theoretically. So yeah, yes, here you can see that in some examples, like in this example, the simpler scheme actually converges faster than the scheme which, uh, which is theoretically sound. But in this case, uh, it's the other way around. Uh, the scheme with the theoretical proof con converges faster. In, in any, well, in all these examples, what is interesting that this scheme that, you know, we don't have even any intuition why it should converge in general, for this, uh, for instances, it converged. So it's something to look, uh, uh, in, in, in to, to, to study in this domain. So I think I, I, I st stop my lecture here, and you can find details in these papers. And I, I think I want just to conclude with one more slide. So what is the next main issue in this uh, in this research direction. I, I, I don't know, so, so far practically it seems to work. <laughs> there, there, there are theoretical, uh, theoretical issues, but practically it seems to work. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you.